God gave Adam his responsibility. God gave Adam his word. Why? Because God ultimately holds men responsible first. Every time I try assembling something without using the instruction manual, I end up with a barely functioning version of the product. Every time I, in all of my own wisdom, try putting the pieces together by myself, because I'm good like that, there's always a disconnect from what I'm holding, what's in front of me, and the picture on the box. And this morning in week four of our relationship series, I just wonder if this is a picture of what's happening in marriages today. Statistics tell us that in 2022, 50% of all marriages now in divorce, 50%. While at the same time, in 2023, statistics tell us that now 63% of all people are no longer living life with a biblical worldview. Let me ask you a simple question. Do you think it's any coincidence that we've thrown out the instruction manual and now the product's broken? You see, God has given us the instruction manual, hear me, for the very thing that he designed. <laughs> Let me remind someone this morning, marriage is not man's idea. Marriage is God's design. Now, I know we're living in a culture, I get it, where marriage is being repackaged and relabeled and redefined. But let me pause for the cause of just making this truth statement. If God designed it, he defines it. If God is the manufacturer or the creator, the designer of marriage, he and he alone gets to say what it looks like, how the pieces should function. This morning in the story we're reading, I believe that God gives us a blueprint. He gives us a blueprint for the very thing that he designed. These are four ways to have the marriage that God designed if you're taking notes. The first thing we see, if you want to have the very thing God intended, how he intended it, the first thing you gotta know is you can't do it, say that with me, alone. Look at Genesis 2.18. It says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, how many of you know, like this is just a good like rule of thumb in general, it's not good just to leave men alone for too long, just like in general. Come on ladies, that's amen right there, that's, that's your moment. Okay, I'm coming for you later, so just don't say too loud. Just... <laughs> True story, my wife and I, we lived in Southern California for about five years and, and uh, it, it was 2020 and we had this really tiny apartment and she went on a girl's trip for about four days. And it was about day three of me being alone in my living room. And, and in our apartment, we had this big wall, this like eight foot wall and our couch was pushed up against it. And, on day three of being left alone, I, I decided that it would be a good idea for me to go purchase a piece of art to surprise my wife. I, uh, I went to the store and I, I mean, I was looking online like best pieces of art, most beautiful pieces of art. Like I'm just trying to be a good husband, you know. I spent all day looking for this piece of art and then I finally found it. I mean, this thing was amazing, six feet wide, four feet. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I get home and I, I hang the piece of art. I'm fired up, I'm excited. I'm giddy for her to get home, surprise her. And the next day she shows up and uh, by the way, no one prepared me for this part of marriage. So single people, like this is a part of it. <laughs> she walks in, the very first thing she says is, uh, what's that? I'm like, it's, it's art. She's like, yeah, that's not gonna be in our living room. I'm like, okay, well, first of all, this is my house and this is my, I'm just joking, I didn't say that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's not how marriage goes. I'm like, babe, this is, this, you have no taste. This is a beautiful piece of art. She goes, Joseph, I'm not gonna have a picture of Joe Burrow smoking a cigar in my living room. You know, teach their own. 
it's art to me, it's now in our attic, and one day when I have a man cave, it will be rehung in my space that I will have. It's not good for man to be alone. Genesis 2.18. <laughs> Now, if you took that word alone and you hyphenated it, it would, it would actually say that it's not good for man to be, to be all one. Now, I love that God himself speaks to this. This is Genesis. This is the beginning of the Bible. I love that God said in the design of this thing called man, remember he's manufacturing us. In the instructions, it says that it's actually not good for this man to be alone. Now, I love this because it speaks to the fact that we do serve a relational God who not only desires that we have a vertical relationship with him, but we really were designed to have horizontal relationships with our spouse. The first thing that you gotta know if you wanna have the marriage God designed is you can't do it alone. The second thing you gotta know if you wanna have the marriage that God designed is your words have, say that with me, power. Look at Genesis 2, 21 of the story we're reading. It says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. In the story we're reading, God puts, God puts Adam to sleep. And some theologians say that it was at this time while he was asleep, that God removed the gentle part of man, the sensitive part of man, the part of man that can be a little bit emotional. And he shaped it with the rib into an irresistible package, hear me, that Adam named woman. Man, let me talk to you for a moment this morning. Your wife will be what you name her. And doing marriage counseling, I've discovered a theme with all men all of them. Every man wants a beautiful, strong, confident, secure woman of God. But how many of you know, like, that didn't just happen accidentally. <laughs> Plants aren't out here just like flourishing on their own. <laughs> they get tended to and they get watered and they, when weeds pop up, they're, they're protected. It's, it's intentional. The picture that I see so clearly when I'm talking about this topic is a gardener tending to his garden. That really is such a great picture of what our words and our marriage must be. I was in a counseling session recently and um, a few months ago in between services and about five minutes into the session, it became very aware to me. This is a marriage that had been going for 15 years now. And it became very aware to me that the husband was verbally abusive. And we got into the session and the wife tried to talk twice and he just like shut her up, just harsh, just cold. And he's talking and at that point, I'm just kind of tuning him out and was looking at this woman, who, beautiful. But it was so evident that she is now a shell of the person she used to be. Oh yeah, your words are powerful. Look at what Proverbs 18, 21 says. It says, death and life are in the what? Power of the tongue. If you wanna have the marriage that God designed for you, you gotta understand the power of your words. I love what Billy Graham says about this. He says, if you want a great marriage, then refuse to speak harshly to your spouse. Harsh words destroy marriages. Speak with kindness, tenderness, and encouragement to each other. I love this last part. The tone of your words will shape the tone of your marriage. The tone of your words will shape the tone of your marriage. Can I just present this thought to you today? If you don't like the tone of your marriage, you need to change the tone of your tongue. The second thing we see if you wanna have the marriage that God designed is you gotta understand your words are powerful. Your words have the ability to do, to do one of two things, either build someone up or tear someone down. Every day, it is my privilege to be able to speak to Rochelle and tell her that you're beautiful and you're amazing and you're generous and you're kind. That is my responsibility as her husband. The third thing you gotta understand if you wanna have the marriage that God designed is you are a helpmate. Look at Genesis 2.18. It says, I will make a 
helper who is just right. Now, I love that that verse says helper because it actually gives like a working definition to what you get in a spouse. Now, like I'm, I didn't say hellmate, jailmate, or stalemate. So if you have any of those three, come see me for marriage counseling. A, a, a helpmate. When you get married, you, you actually get a helpmate. This was something that I remember learning very early on in marriage is, you know, I have an amazing family. My wife has an amazing family. Both of us have so many great friendships, but when you get married, you only have one helpmate. This means on the tough days in marriage, because how many of y'all know there are some tough days in marriage? This means in the moments where one of you missed the mark, because inevitably all of us missed the mark, your God-assigned role is not to say you did it again. Your God-assigned role is not to say you're just like your mom. Your God-assigned role is not to say, I knew it was gonna happen. No, 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 no. Your God-assigned role is to be a helpmate, to help in ways that only you can. Now, what are some practical ways that we can be a helpmate? I'm gonna give you two things. These are practical, but make no mistake, they are powerful. The first thing is you gotta learn how to listen. Come on, how many are talkers? I'm a talker. I like to have the last word. I like to have the final word, the final say. And like, I'm not really listening to you when you're talking to me. I'm actually thinking about how I'm gonna destroy you the moment you stop speaking. Uh, my dad always used to tell me that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. And it's that's because he wants us to listen twice as much as we speak. Look at James 1.19 says, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Dr. Tony Evans says it beautifully. Your marriage should be a safe place for your hurts to be heard. Boy, marriages, relationships, dating relationships, this is where they become so unhealthy. Whenever your marriage stops being a safe place for your spouse to share their hearts, their dreams, their desires, their disappointments, that's when they start finding someone at work that's listening to them. And they start going online and finding someone to listen to them because their home is no longer a safe place. Yeah, the first thing, if you wanna really be a helpmate, actually listen. The second thing, this is just helpful, if you wanna learn how to be a helpmate, is you gotta take action. Look at 1 John 3, 18. It says, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with, say it with me, actions. Look what Jimmy Evans says. Action speaks louder than words. We can apologize over and over, but if our actions do not change, the words become meaningless. Wow, that's powerful. Here's the truth. Some of y'all are here today and in your relationships and your marriages, your words are meaningless because they've been empty of action for a really, really, really long time. And if that's you, I wanna give you some encouragement this morning. I wanna encourage you to enter into a season of putting some time between who you say you are and who you actually are. That just requires action, taking action in your marriage, taking action in your parenting, taking action when you get home. Two things that you can do if you wanna be a helpmate. The first is listen, the second is take action. The third thing we see if you want to have a marriage God designed is you got to be a helpmate. And lastly, you got to understand clearly that you both have roles. A few months ago, I was in the lobby after church and hugging on people, just talking to people. And there was an older gentleman, him and his wife showed up and she was like pushing a rocker and they were like holding each other. And it was one of those Hallmark pictures. And I just said, hey, I just got to talk to you just for a moment. How long have y'all been married? He said, we've been married for 58 years. I said, okay, well, can we just pause and you just give me one thing, just give me one, like, what's the secret? What's just, what's just one thing that you could give a young married guy? And he told me something that really was so profound and it sounded so simple, but the more I unpacked it when I went home, I'm like, this is powerful. He said, one of the best things, if I could go all over again and tell myself at the beginning is to understand clearly that both of you have roles. And then he said this, he said, marriage is like a dance. And when you both perform your roles, the dance is beautiful. A 
Ephesians 5 makes the husband's role and the wife's role very clear. Ladies, Ephesians 5 says, wives, be, say that word with me, devoted to your husband like you were tenderly devoted to the Lord. Now, I love that definition of devotion. Devotion means love, loyalty, and unwavering support. Love, loyalty, and unwavering support. Walk down the aisle. You know, you're walking down there and get there and it's beautiful and your wife is just, it's like everything else disappears. It's like you forget everything else that's around you. It's just, it's just y'all two and you're just, you're locked in. And, and then everyone in this room, we all said the same thing. Said your vows. All of us did. Said, I take Rochelle to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for richer or in sickness till death do us part. So often today, I don't see a, a kind of devotion that the Bible talks about. I see a conditional devotion to where I'm in it for better, for richer, and for health. True love, loyalty, and unwavering support isn't tested and for better, for wealth, and in health. No, no, no. True devotion isn't even tested until it's in sickness and for worse and for poor. So often when it gets difficult, people just bounce and leave. I didn't know it was gonna be like this. Yesterday I was uh, driving home and where I live, it's, there's a gas station right around Sugar Mill Pond and it's right on the corner. And I went into the gas station and uh, I went inside to swipe my card and I'm there and I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, talking to the, register, the lady at the register and it's kind of a high, tall counter so I couldn't really see behind, but just casual conversation. And, and I hear three kids laughing behind the counter. So I kind of peek around and I see three kids that look like they're under the age of 10 and they're all gathered around an iPad. They're, they're laughing. So I start talking to the woman at the counter. I said, are these your kids? She said, yes. I told her I'm a pastor and we begin to talk life. And she began to tell me her story and her and her husband married for almost 20 years and they had also lived in a part of Southern California that I lived in. We, we connected on that, we're just talking. And you're gonna tell me how amazing her husband is. He's been an amazing provider. He's also a man of God, goes to a different church. And, and then she began to tell me how, how three months ago, uh, her husband's father passed away tragically. That was his best friend. That was his rock. She said now uh, her husband has actually fallen into like a clinical depression and he can't even get out of bed. She began to tell me how she, uh, for the first time, went from being a homemaker to getting two jobs while her husband gets help. They don't have childcare on Fridays and Saturdays, so the kids come to work with her for both of her jobs, 10 hour days. And I'm sitting here looking at this woman thinking, devotion, devotion. In sickness, for worse, poor, when the money doesn't show up, when it's not convenient, when it'd be easy to walk, devotion. I asked you a simple question this morning. Do you have that kind of devotion? Is it for better, for richer, and in health? Or is it in sickness? For worse, poor. Ephesians 5 makes the role very clear. Just be devoted. 
Men, Ephesians 5 makes the husband's role very clear as well. It says, husbands, provide leadership for your wife, just as Christ provides leadership for his church. When you read that word leadership, I don't want you like banging your chest like, yeah, what's up? I'm the leader. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, what I say goes, what's up? Good luck with that in marriage. <laughs> I actually thought that's how it worked when I got married. I quickly realized that's not how it works at all. <laughs> yeah, that word leadership, all that actually means is responsibility. Come on, business owners, you know this. Everyone wants to be the leader. And you, 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 on Christmas and everyone else with their families, you're thinking about, are the bills paid? Are my employees taken care of? There's no days off. You're the most responsible. You're the leader. Congratulations. You get to carry the responsibility. I want to break this down for a moment. God did not create Adam and Eve at the same time. You know this if you read the story of Genesis in the beginning. God created Adam first. God gave Adam his responsibility. God gave Adam his word. Why? Because God ultimately holds men responsible first. When the fall happened, God didn't come saying, Adam and Eve, where are y'all? What did he say? He said, Adam, where are you? When God made his covenant, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. Hear me, women are critical, women are essential. I'm not even talking about rank. I'm talking about responsibility. When men fail in their role, it's like the foundation of a house failing. The other parts are critical, but their, the stability is dependent on the foundation. Foundation doesn't have to be pretty, but it better be firm and it better be consistent and it better show up. Make no mistake, men, if you're here today, when a husband and a father abandon their role, the ripple effect it leaves is a tsunami that your family will drown in. I was in student ministry for almost 10 years as a youth pastor and something that become very apparent. I don't wanna say 100%, but I'll say 99.99999% of all troubled kids that I ever worked with was a result of a father that abandoned his role. Every girl that was always hopping from relationship to relationship, giving herself away, was looking to be told you're valuable you're worth it, I love you, because they never got it from their father. And oh, the dark places young men go when they're left with inevitably these two things in the absence of a father. Number one, why do you leave me? And number two, if he left me, then I must not be valuable, because who leaves valuable things? I can't think of anything more opposite to this book, more contrary to a picture of a kind, heavenly, loving father than a father who abandons his role. A couple of weeks ago, I was preaching and I, and I kept using that word father, 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 father. And I got off the stage and I was talking to a young man. He said, man, I hope it's not a father because the picture that I have is horrible. I wanna give you a charge this morning. It's time to rise up in your role. It's time to start showing up. Men and women of God, hear me. It's time to start speaking life over your marriage. It's time to start taking action in your home. It's time to start being consistent. It's time to start being steadfast. It's time to build your life on God's word, his promises, and his truth. It's time to start showing up. And if you'll do that, here's what I'm confident of. Confident. You will have the very thing that God
God designed. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more interesting insights.